Good morning. I hope you're all doing really well. Got a great video lined up for you this week. It's on the background, purpose, and meaning of Christ the King Sunday. And this is a great topic to cover right now. Christ the King Sunday is sort of the New Year's Eve for the liturgical year. It's actually the last Sunday of the liturgical or the lectionary year cycle before we move into Advent, which starts the next year. And before we jump into the content, I just want to get the business out of the way. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris. I've been teaching seminary and doing research for the past, oh, 20 to 30 years. Kind of lose track every now and then. The purpose of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and make it available to a much wider audience using the platform of YouTube. So if you like this material and you find it useful, be sure to subscribe, hit the notifications, then YouTube will let you know every time I post new material. Let other people know about it, hit that share button and send them a link to these videos. And finally, leave a comment down below if you have a question or you'd like to make a comment on the videos. So let's get into this material. Now, because the lectionary readings after the season of Easter until now have basically followed a chronological reading through one of the Gospels. If you're in year A, it's Matthew, year B, it's Mark, year C, it's Luke, and within those three years, John is sliced in at different points in time. What this means is that if we start over here in Easter, then we have a slow progression as we go through the Gospels of conflict and intensity as Jesus goes from Galilee and finally ends up in Jerusalem. And during that last week in Jerusalem, he makes a lot of statements and prophecies about his future reign, the judgment of Israel and the world, separating the sheep from the goats, and so on down the line. So as a result, because of where we're at right now in the lectionary cycle of readings, it really fits this theme of Christ the King very, very well. Stick around to the end of this video. I'll have a quick tour through this week's lectionary readings and show how they all fit together around this theme and the purpose of Christ the King Sunday. Given how well Christ the King Sunday fits the lectionary readings for this week, and also how it sets us up for Advent, which is going to come immediately after it, it's rather surprising to learn that Christ the King Sunday is perhaps the most recent addition to the liturgical or the lectionary calendar for the year. It was only added in 1925 by Pope Pius XI. The date, timing, and background behind Pope Pius XI adding Christ the King Sunday in 1925 is rather important. It helps underline the importance of the message of this Sunday to our situation here today. Pope Pius XI is known as the Pope between the Great Wars. He served between World War I and World War II. During the time that Pope Pius served, Europe was trying to get back on its feet again after World War I. Many of the countries were decimated. They had lost large percentages of the young men. Their economies were in ruin. So these countries are trying to rebuild and get back on their feet again. At the same time they're doing this, a lot of different political and national movements come on the scene that create a very dangerous situation for Europe. In particular, Pope Pius was very concerned about the diminished role that the church played within society after World War I. He was also very concerned about the destructive forces that he saw taking place politically and nationally across Europe. These included the rise of communism in Russia and also capitalistic greed within Western Europe. While he was concerned about the rise of communism within Russia, there were more pressing concerns that were closer to home that he was more concerned with. In particular, within Italy, he was very concerned with what he saw as the rise of fascism, the same within Spain, and then the seeds of Nazism within Germany. He saw all of these sort of popular nationalistic movements as very dangerous, not only to society, but to the church as well. But perhaps what worried him the most was the way different church leaders, both within the Catholic Church and outside it, were aligning themselves with these various fascist or nationalistic leaders that were coming on the scene. For Pope Pius XI, the church 
was not under the state, nor was it part of the state. The church was above the state and it exercised judgment over all political parties. Now, the danger they saw with church leaders aligning themselves with nationalistic leaders really presented a threat to the church. And I'm going to be reading several sections from his writings here so that you get a flavor of what he's talking about. He expressed the danger that he saw when the church aligns itself with a political party or leader in the following terms. Gradually, the religion of Christ came to be likened to false religions and to be placed ignominiously on the same level with them. It was then put under the power of the state and tolerated more or less at the whim of princes and rulers. What he does is he goes back through the history of the church and he looked at different periods of times where the church tried to butter itself up or ingratiate itself or align itself with various political leaders. The result was, he says, is that it is then reduced to the level of any other sort of pagan religion and as a result is under the control of these princes or rulers. And as if writing to us today, he instituted the feast to combat these tendencies. He writes, the seeds of discord sown far and wide, those bitter enmities and rivalries between nations which still hinder so much the cause of peace. That insatiable greed, which is so often hidden just under the pretense of public spirit and patriotism, and gives rise to so many private quarrels, a blind and immoderate selfishness, making men seek nothing but their own comfort and advantage. Pope Pius XI thought that by instituting this feast, the church would be reminded on a yearly basis that Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he holds the keys to eternity in his hands. Therefore, the church should not fear political leaders, nor should it align itself under them, because these leaders come and go. They're ephemeral. They're here one day and they're gone. Instead, we align ourselves with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, whose reign is eternal. He placed the feast towards the end of the lectionary or liturgical year. Now he placed it at the very end of October, the last Sunday of October, and I'll get to why it's moved in a bit here. But he placed it at this time in the lectionary reading schedule because of the eschatological focus that many of the readings this week have. The eschatological focus within many of these readings remind us that Christ was the goal of human history, the focal point of the desires of history and civilization, the center of mankind, the joy of all hearts, and the fulfillment of all aspirations. So you can see, he set the theological bar for Christ the King Sunday very high. And in regard to the idea of Christ being referred to as King, he writes that this idea of Christ being metaphorically referred to as King is because of the high degree of perfection whereby he excels all creatures. So he is said to reign in the hearts of men, both by reason and by the keenness of his intellect and the extent of his knowledge, and also because he is very truth, and it is from him that all truth must be obediently received by all mankind. He reigns, too, in the wills of men. I hope you're beginning to gain a little bit of an appreciation for the theological and the biblical basis that Pope Pius XI laid for the institution of this feast, Christ the King Sunday. Now, the sad thing about Pope Pius XI's goals is that when Mussolini came to power in Italy, he at first avowed himself to be an atheist. But then shortly after he took power, he then declared that he was going to establish Italy and his rule as the most Christian of all rules. When he did this, Pope Pius saw an opportunity to influence the Italian state and also reinstate the church's role within society. And so he became a supporter of Mussolini as time went along. As a result, when we look back upon his time as Pope, we really see the mistake that he made when he thought that he could use this atheist Mussolini as a person to bring about the goals of the Catholic Church. It was a disastrous marriage and it should have never taken place and serves as a warning to our situation today as well. Returning to the dangers and threats and challenges that Pope Pius XI saw aligned against the church, 
he instituted this feast. You might ask yourself, how is one Sunday's observance going to challenge the forces of popular nationalism, fascism, capitalistic greed, or the rise of communism? Isn't this a bit far-fetched and optimistic in his estimation of Christ the King Sunday? Here is his answer. History, in fact, tells us that in the course of ages, these festivals have been instituted one after another according to the needs or the advantage of the people of Christ seem to demand, as when they needed strength to face a common danger, when they were attacked by insidious heresies, when they needed to be urged to the pious consideration of some mystery of faith or some other divine blessing. Now, if you want to understand what he's referring to here, think about the impact that Christmas or Easter have upon your faith. These feasts during the year really change, transform, and remind us a great deal of various aspects of our faith and what we believe. The same was his hope for Christ the King Sunday. I stated earlier that Pope Pius XI placed Christ the King Sunday as the last Sunday in October. So why are we celebrating it now towards the very end of November? What takes place is in 1969, after the Second Vatican II Council and the Catholic Church organizes its three-year cycle for lectionary readings, in 1969, they moved the date for Christ the King Sunday from the last Sunday of October to the last Sunday of the lectionary or the liturgical year. And this is why I said it's sort of like the New Year's Eve for the lectionary year. On the Protestant side, as the lectionary cycle was being revised with the revised common lectionary, they picked up the feast of Christ the King Sunday from the Catholic Church and the readings for that Sunday as well. So today, Anglican, Lutheran, Presbyterian, and many other Protestant churches celebrate Christ the King Sunday on the last Sunday of the lectionary year, or the last Sunday of ordinary or Pentecost season. So here we are today, some almost 100 years after Pope Pius XI instituted this feast. There's at least five themes that Pope Pius originally promulgated with Christ the King Sunday that still resonate loudly today. The first one is, is that at the end of time, Christ will exercise judgment, not just over individuals, but over churches, institutions, cultures, and human history as a whole. This is why this idea of Christ the King is so central to this Sunday's observance. Second, by placing at the end of the lectionary year, while these eschatological readings are being read within the church, the festival proclaims Christ as the goal of human history, the focal point of the desires of history and civilization, the center point of humankind and the joy of all human hearts, the fulfillment of all aspirations. In short, we have a very positive reinforcement of the feast's original polemics against various political ideologies that were raging during his day and that seem to be making a comeback within our cultures today. The third theme that Pope Pius wanted us to grasp is that because we are going to be judged by Christ at the end of time, this means that we are no longer our own property. We have been bought with a price, therefore we are to glorify God with our bodies because we will be held accountable for this. The fourth theme that is conveyed in Christ the King Sunday is that because Christ is going to judge us at the end of time, this brings up the idea that we are to be faithful here and now in our lives. And this theme of faithfulness is one of the key ideas that Christ the King Sunday wants to strike into our hearts by way of application. The past two weeks, we've read the parable of the ten virgins and then the parable of the talents. And both of those passages out of the Gospel of Matthew hit this theme of faithfulness. Are we faithful with what we have and how we are preparing our lives? Are we being faithful to Christ our King, or have we been captured and led aside by some other ideology that seeks claim to our hearts? Another way to ask this is to which kingdom or republic do we owe our allegiance? Even if that kingdom or idea or nationalistic movement aligns with some of the values that are within the kingdom, if we have aligned ourselves too closely with that nationalistic or political idea, 
then we have betrayed our fundamental allegiance to Christ, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that will exercise judgment upon these political or nationalistic movements. Finally, Christ the King Sunday has a very strong eschatological flavor or end times tone to it. It points to the time when Christ will return, judge the earth, and institute his kingdom upon it. This then leads into the theme of Advent, which has a very strong eschatological flavor to it as well. Ah, but I can't get ahead of myself here. I'm going to save that for the next video. Now, I told you at the very beginning, I would walk you through this week's lectionary readings and show how they fit this theme of Christ the King Sunday. So let's take a look at these and see how they all fit together. Our first passage is the reading from the Old Testament, and it comes from Ezekiel 34. And I want to look at verses 15 and 16 in this week's reading. It talks about this prophecy when Yahweh himself will be the shepherd of his people. I myself will be the shepherd of my people, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. So you see this theme of Christ returning as a shepherd, which is often a metaphor for a king in the Old Testament, and the judgment that he's going to exercise there. The second passage comes from Psalm 95, and in particular verses 6 and 7. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Creator, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep He owns. Now notice how Psalm 95 here ties together these two ideas, that Christ is our Lord, and He is also the shepherd. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep that he owns. And then finally in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 21, Paul writes, What is the incomparable greatness of his power towards us who believe, as displayed in the exercise of his immense strength? This power he exercised in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at their right hand in the heavenly realms far above every rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. Now you see how Paul takes these themes and just lays them out in such succinct and concise theological terms that we really have this picture that Christ has been raised from the dead and he is now seated at the right hand of God on the throne of heaven. Finally, we come to the reading from Matthew, our gospel of this reading. And in this passage, it's immediately after the parable of the talents, Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So you have this beautiful image there. I mean, sheep and goats are not hard to tell apart. And you get this picture that in the age to come, that as Christ separates people, the division between those who have been faithful to Christ and those who haven't is going to be very clear and evident, and they're going to be separated apart at that point in time. This is why Christ the King Sunday is such an important remembrance and observance within the church's liturgical year. It reminds us of this future judgment and our faithfulness in the here and now to prepare for that. So in the comments below, I'd love to hear what you think about Christ the King Sunday, what it means to you, and maybe perhaps what you've learned or other observations that you have about this particular Sunday. You can leave them in the comments down below. I don't know about you, but I think what Pope Pius XI was trying to do in 1925 is as valid today as it was back then. I found researching and writing on this particular feast something that was spiritually meaningful to me and really challenged my life in a lot of different areas. I hope it has been beneficial and something that you found useful as well. Remember to subscribe, leave a comment down below, hit the notification bell if you want to know when something new comes up, and share the videos with your friends. Until next week, I will leave you with the peace of the Lord.